What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address by Elder Robert R. Stoyer was given on September 30th, 2008. As mentioned previously, we're pleased to have Elder Robert R. Stoyer as today's devotional speaker. Elder Stoyer was sustained a member of the 70 in 2001. He has served as president of the Brazil North Area and currently serves in the missionary and correlation departments of the Church. Elder Stoyer earned bachelor's and medical degrees from the University of Minnesota and was trained as a diagnostic physician. He was the founder and chairman of Hemometrics Corporation. Elder Stoyer has served in the Church in numerous callings, among them bishop, high counselor, and president of the Brazil Sao Paulo North Mission. Elder Stoyer and his wife, the former Margaret Black, are the parents of five children, and they have 13 grandchildren. Elder Stoyer, we welcome you to Brigham Young University. Thank you. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My wife and I are greatly honored to be here with you enthusiastic students at this wonderful university, also with the faculty, too. I notice there are some here. I've titled my message today, Just In Case Someone Asks, I Will Be Ready. As a teenager, I found a simple thought that had guided Abraham Lincoln's life. President Lincoln was asked how he was able to become the President of the United States. His self-effacing answer was, I kept preparing myself just in case. This down-to-earth phrase inspired me, and I began looking for ways that uh, could prepare me to be ready for the future as well. As an example, as a young missionary in Brazil, I decided to learn and speak Portuguese 100 percent. Returning home from my mission, I didn't think I'd be using Portuguese again. But two years later, I took the medical school entrance exam, and lo and behold, my Portuguese was extremely helpful uh, and useful for me. Because Portuguese is a strongly influenced Latin-based language, as are many medical terms. Twenty years later, my family and I returned to São Paulo, Brazil, as mission president. And 35 years after that original decision, my wife and I returned to serve in the area presidency in the north of Brazil. Even today, the joy of speaking another language without having to interpret in your mind uh, word for word is such a mystery and a blessing. Another example. I, like many other Church members listening to Elder Neil A. Maxwell's talks, noted that he would regularly cite from Bartlett's familiar quotations. So I started to read Bartlett's familiar quotations to be prepared just in case someone asked me to give a talk in church. Thomas Edison said, Opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. Likewise, Disraeli said, One secret of success is for a man to be ready for his opportunity when it comes. When President Henry B. Eyring was first called to the First Presidency, he referred to important counsel his father had given him. That counsel was, Hal, always have something in your mind at all times to think about when you don't need to be thinking about it. For me, that meant we will be prepared for inspiration on a specific topic if we have been seriously contemplating it. Some, on the other hand, may conclude that it's too hard to always be preparing or to do such focused thinking. But doing hard things builds confidence and strengthens character. We learn much 
from those who lean hard against us. To prepare just in case someone asks becomes even more important as the world becomes more complex. One approach in preparing ourselves is to simplify and find the kernel truths and thoughts. A kernel operator in mathematics transforms the original unwieldy, perhaps confusing problem into an easier solution. In computer technology, the computer, the, the kernel is the central component of the computer operating system. It's the core or nucleus that makes things work. In medicine, the same key concept is incorporated in the word pathognomonic. A pathognomonic sign is a particular sign whose presence means that, beyond any doubt, a particular disease is present. For example, if so-called coplic spots are present in the mouth, a doctor's diagnosis of measles is certain. This is also similar to the well-known mathematical statement of proof. If and only if the necessary and sufficient condition A is met, then condition B is true. To prepare our, and simplify our lives is like finding those kernel operators, the necessary and sufficient conditions, or discovering the pathognomonic signs so we can have confidence in our actions and do the right things for the right reasons. We know the scriptures are very clear about certain laws, bounds, and conditions as well. And unto every kingdom is given a law, and unto every law there are certain bounds also and conditions. And there is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven <coughs> before the foundations of this world upon which all blessings are predicated. Embracing key scriptures and doctrines can help us simplify and prepare for life's important decisions. The words God uses in the scriptures and the words of the living prophets will help us find our way, especially today. One such kernel scripture comes from the words of the prophet Micah and gives great strength and clarity of direction. In Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, we read, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? The Lord tells us what is good and what pleases him. Certainly a core message here teaches us to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Note that the Lord only gives us three things to remember. This kernel, therefore, simplifies our direction and gives great clarity to our actions. First, we notice that the Lord requires us to do justly. The Old Testament Hebrew word for just means to do right or to do righteousness or to have a just weight or balance when measuring something. In today's vernacular, to do justly may also mean to be fair in our treatment with one another. In Portuguese, for example, the words just and fair are the same word, justo, doing that which is right in the sight of the Lord helps us become a just person. A just man's character, how he thinks, and how he desires to learn all he can, 
is described in Proverbs chapter 9. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. We recall Elder David A. Bednar's recent comment here at BYU. Learning to love learning is central to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hence, the things we put into our souls mold our unique character and individual identity. For all our efforts in learning the truth and doing that which is right in the sight of the Lord, the Lord promises this wonderful blessing. And if a person gains more knowledge and intelligence in this life through his diligence and obedience than another, he will have so much the advantage in the world to come. The end result and blessing of being just are worth every effort. As we read in the 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the just shall have part in the first resurrection and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, are given all things, and have received of His fullness and of His glory, are God's, even the sons of God, and shall dwell in the presence of God and His Christ forever and ever. Second, as we saw in Micah chapter 6, the Lord requires us to love mercy. Mercy from the Old Testament Hebrew word has the connotation of gentleness, kindliness, grace, and forgiveness and compassion upon anyone. These are attributes of God. Certainly we desire God's mercy towards us and are happy like Enoch to know that mercy shall go before thy face and have no end. But the Lord also gives us the commandment, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Daily life seems to teach us that the foundation and enabling power for doing justly comes from a heart full of compassion. We notice that the Savior's instruction to the Nephites, What manner of men ought ye to be, even as I am, came after the Lord taught the principles of compassion, grace, and mercy. The Lord encourages us to rely on His grace, saying, My grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. Now notice the necessary and sufficient condition He gives us. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. Third, again Micah tells us that the Lord requires us to walk humbly with God. The Old Testament Hebrew word humble connotes to bow down, bow our heads, or be low in situation. We recall Enoch feeling overwhelmed with the Lord's command to call his people to repentance. He prostrated himself before the Lord. And when Enoch had heard these words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. Then he was ready for the Lord's instructions. It seems very significant that when we bow our heads in prayer, we also get ourselves ready for the Lord's instruction to our heart and our mind. There are many things that cause us to bow our head, humbling us every day. At times, we may actually control situations. For example, an engineer controls the construction of a bridge or building, or a doctor controls a surgical procedure, and both see positive outcomes. They may conclude that their skill guaranteed the outcome. But other times, we experience circumstances in our lives seemingly beyond our control, such as getting a bad case of the flu on the day of our biggest final exam. Happens to you quite a lot. 
or our car breaking down on the way to an important interview. The unexpected occurs seemingly at the worst possible time. Many in the world conclude that because of this apparent randomness, no one is in control and no one can know the future. But the scriptures and the prophets affirm that God is not only master of the universe, but is in the details and knows the end from the beginning. He knoweth all things, for all things are present before mine eyes, he said. It has been said, the great act of faith is when man decides that he is not God. When we so decide and accept the limits of our external control, we are powerfully sustained by faith in God. We trust his timing and have confidence in his plan. Elder Neil A. Maxwell observed, because we are eternal beings, time is not our natural dimension. And life is so designed that we constantly feel time and its prickly presence. We feel this prickly presence when unexpected, undesired circumstances irritate us. Yet it is those events that mold our character. Perhaps the difficult situations in our lives teach us what it is that we may truly control ourselves, our thoughts, our words, our deeds, and our reaction to life's unexpected events. President James E. Faust reminded us, it's not so much what happens to us but how we deal with what happens to us. Recognizing our personal responsibility and exercising self-control make repentance possible and strengthens character. Each day tests how we will react to unexpected circumstances, for the same set of circumstances can bring either resentment or gratitude. Another test may be how we react when those who don't live God's commandments seem to get ahead in the world, while we, trying very hard to serve the Lord, don't seem to have much outward success. But in 3 Nephi chapter 24, the Lord reorients us, saying, Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. What doth it profit that we have kept his ordinances, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. They that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Hence, even though we may set goals, establish procedures, make plans, and act nobly, we may not control the immediate results. We must continue, however, to seek the good, establish the right, and walk humbly in the full faith that God guarantees the just and merciful outcome. The courage to vigorously move ahead thusly was echoed by Longfellow. The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. Or as stated simply by President Harold B. Lee, it is the, pers <clears throat> it is the pursuit of easy things <clears throat> that make men weak. The pursuit of hard things makes men strong. 
A key scripture from the Book of Mormon can help in our personal preparation in Alma chapter 3. For every man receiveth wages of him whom he listeth to obey. This scripture is pointing to the fact that the master to whom we incline will be the one who will reward us, either to the Savior who will grant us eternal life, or if we lean towards Satan, we will receive spiritual death. We recognize the verb list is to tilt, incline, or move off center just a little. It's like when we slightly move off center in a canoe. The canoe quickly lists and finally tips us overboard. Listing may also connote leaning first to one side, then leaning to the other side. And we know the result of wafting back and forth in a canoe. Overboard, we go again. The Apostle James wisely taught, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Similarly, the Lord said to John the Revelator, through John the Revelator, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Listing may also suggest being carried away on the subtle, ever-learning breeze. The Apostle Paul described our day as follows. In the last days men shall be lovers of their own selves, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning may be interesting, but we cannot sample from every intriguing corner of life, despite the Internet. We are reminded it is not a matter of if we will accept divine truth. It is a matter of when. We are told in Philippians that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. At times we can't discern whether we are tilting or not. Hence, we need guides, especially the Holy Ghost, to point out the slight adjustments to our lives as we begin to tip or list. Thusly, we do not waste time and can more safely reach our ultimate goal. The Book of Mormon prophet Jacob counseled us, You that are pure in heart, look unto God with firmness of mind, and pray unto Him with exceeding faith, and receive the pleasing word of God, and feast upon His love, for ye may, if your minds are firm, forever. Mahatma Gandhi gave some salient guide points as well. He said, Sin is wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, religion without sacrifice, politics without principle. Indeed, we too can learn much by observation, and we can learn even more by allowing our guides to give us suggestions. President James E. Faust said, Learning by experience has value, but the school of hard knocks is deserving of its name. Progression comes faster and easier by learning from our parents, those who love us, and our teachers. We can also learn from the mistakes of others, observing the consequences of their wrong choices." End quote. So we simply need to catch ourselves before we tilt too far. Those studying electrical engineering know that feedback loops prevent circuits from becoming unstable. Even experienced pilots will encounter sensory illusions or worse if they make a slow banking turn without visual references. The hair cells of the human vestibular apparatus can't discern the correct bearing, and the pilot quickly loses reality. Like those visual references, maintaining stability, our guides 
can become a lamp unto our feet, helping us see the important signposts before we list too far. We can then make the slight adjustments to any listing. Although humbling, we will receive yet another promise. <clears throat> because thou hast seen thy weakness, thou shalt be made strong. How encouraging. The Lord wants us to see our own weaknesses, and then his grace is sufficient for us all as we come to him. When we understand and accept true principles, our decisions do become clearer and less confusing. Thus, acceptance of the truths can make us free, free from ambivalence, ambiguity, tentativeness, excuse-making, and ignorance. Accepting truths requires obeying the feelings of the spirit, self-discipline, and then courage to live that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Describing this type of courage, Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, it will take the same kind of courage that the Spartans showed when they tenaciously held a small mountain pass against overwhelming numbers of Persians. The Spartans were told that if they did not give up, the Persians would darken the skies with their arrows of their numerous archers. The Spartans answered, so much the better. We will fight in the shade. With this type of courage, we can accept a true principle as it really is, without debate, sidestepping, or hesitancy. Thus, by following the impressions of the Holy Ghost, we will find solutions and wisely use our precious gift of time. The power in truth gives complete commitment to our lives, clarity to our decisions, and certainty that our course in life is according to God's will and our divine character emerges. As the restored truths sink into our soul, we become more keenly aware that only the power of the redemption and the resurrection of Jesus Christ can and does preserve our individual identity. It is this power that requires that the grave must deliver up the spirits and must deliver up the body, and all men become incorruptible and immortal living souls. In fact, these restored truths and doctrinal declarations create an intensification of our individual divine identity and a greater awareness and gratitude for the power of the redemption of the Son of God. President James E. Faust said, Without turning back to the word of our Creator, no one is wise enough to sort out what ethical, spiritual, and moral value should be taught to the next generation. May we search for, find, and embrace the kernel truths to simplify our lives so that our decisions can be yea, yea, or nay, nay. We want to be ready when the Lord asks, for he will ask. He said to John the Revelator, To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, <clears throat> even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. The Lord is so gracious, he further prepares us for that day when he said, I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive of his fullness. May we also move from grace to grace as did the Lord and in due time receive of the fullness of the Father is my prayer for all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 
For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This BYU devotional address by Elder Robert R. Stoyer was given on September 30th, 2008. Thank you.